Good morning, Centerpoint Church and anybody else who's watching. Welcome to the sermon, our worship of God that is still online. We will be meeting in person soon in stages. Um, I'm really looking forward to that time. We will continue to offer at least the sermon, probably the music as well, uh, online for those who will not be coming back when we first open the doors. We can only have a third capacity in the church anyways, so we are working towards uh, being back together fully as a family. really long for that day. And I haven't even really had a live service with you all as your head pastor, so... This morning, uh, we are continuing our study of the book of Exodus. We are in chapter 4, verses 10 through 31. We're going to finish the chapter. And as we've been doing, I just want you to pause the video and read the, that scripture to your family out loud. In addition to the fear of dying, fear of heights, fear of different animals like snakes or spiders, claustrophobia, uh, a very relatively common fear that people have is called glossophobia, the fear of public speaking. Some people even rank this higher than their fear of death. I was never that bad, but I certainly, when I was younger, did not enjoy speaking in front of people. Do you remember how you felt when you had to go before the class uh, in front of other people when all eyes were on you? I did not like that feeling. I didn't even really like to participate in class discussion that much unless I absolutely knew that I had the right answer. But then when there were those uh, mandatory get up and recite a poem or give an oral report, something like that, I was the classic heart-pounding Sweaty palms, you know, just get up there and mutter through before I passed out. The only way I became comfortable with public speaking was, A, realizing that it was mostly in my head, that people are actually rooting for you to do well. They're not wanting you to fail. It's just kind of awkward for everyone when someone stumbles. And B, to just start doing it and get over it with practice and experience. Well, I remember my young life leader when I was in high school asking me to give my testimony at one of the clubs. And the, I think the only reason I said yes was because I realized I needed to get work through this, work through my fear that this wasn't a classroom setting, it was a ministry setting. So I, I worked really hard and I practiced it but man, still, I, I stumbled through that. And then I had the brilliant idea that, oh gosh, if, it, if it's rough with the speaking, why don't I get my guitar and sing a solo? I hadn't sung solos before, and, and this was not the best idea because when I was nervous speaking, I was just as nervous singing. My voice was cracking and uh, shook through the whole thing. There were a couple of girls crying at the end, which I, I like to think was just their conviction or just loving the song or whatever, but I think it was just they felt so bad for me. Today's text is going to highlight another person who was scared by the thought of speaking. Speaking in public, he didn't consider himself qualified to accept a huge task that God had called him to. And I'm reminded, you know, the plot of so many classic stories uh, involve an unqualified person taking on a task that they're initially reluctant to accept because they feel they aren't up to it, right? Frodo taking the ring of power to Mount Doom. Luke Skywalker, right, uh, joining the fight against the Empire. Harry Potter defeating Voldemort. Hamlet challenging his uncle, Esther saving her people from Haman's plans of genocide. 
If you haven't been with us in the last couple weeks, we've been reading through Exodus chapters 3 and 4. And this is where Moses, or God calls Moses into action from the burning bush. Today's passage is the end of that conversation, as well as the actions that Moses takes to start fulfilling God's mission for him. So the first eight verses, God provides Moses a mouthpiece. Verses 10 through 17. So my first point, God provides Moses a mouthpiece. But Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent, either in the past or since you have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and of tongue. Then the Lord said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Who makes him mute or deaf or seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Now, therefore, go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall speak. But he said, Oh, my Lord, please send someone else. Then the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is there not Aaron, your brother, the Levite? I know that he can speak well. Behold, he is coming out to meet you, and when he sees you, he will be, you, he will be glad in his heart. You shall speak to him and put the words in his mouth, and I will be with your mouth and with his mouth and will teach you both what to do. He shall speak for you to the people, and he shall be your mouth, and you shall be as God to him. And take in your hand this staff with which you shall do the signs. So Moses' objections up till now have been, I, I'm not the right guy. They won't believe me. And now he moves into this, I'm not a good speaker. Now, we don't know if he had a speech impediment uh, or just not a lot of confidence because he had been a shepherd for 40 years and it had been that long since he had really spoken Egyptian. I think I tend to agree with Douglas Stewart's commentary, though, that says that Moses does a lot of speaking later uh, in Exodus and the next three books, and there's no mention anywhere that he had difficulties. And so I think the issue is not so much a speech problem as it's exaggerated humility in the face of being asked to do something uh, or offer something that was very common in that area in that time. Uh, there's other biblical examples. Abraham in Genesis 18 calls himself ashes and dust when he speaks to the Lord. David says that he is a poor man and not well known, even after he's killed Goliath. Um, Jeremiah said he couldn't speak, and he was just a child. So like those men, Moses was responding to a great assignment with the proper sort of exaggerated humility and self-effacement that was expected and valued in his culture. Whatever the reason, God essentially responds that he is aware of Moses' exact abilities and limitations. After all, he created him, and he created him exactly how he needed to be. And it's ultimately not going to be Moses' speeches that convince Pharaoh to let the people go, right? It's going to be the plagues that God sends. But God has still called Moses to go and to be his mouthpiece. God will be his speechwriter. Moses just needs to deliver the speeches. And God will give him the, the ability when he needs it. There's a real sense of the old phrase that I heard a lot growing up. That God doesn't necessarily call the equipped, but he always equips the called. And he's offering that to Moses. Now, do you ever throw out a bunch of excuses when someone asks you to do something that you don't really want to do? Hey man, we would love for you to come bowling with us sometime. Oh gosh, uh, I got to check the family schedule. Oh man, the kids a lot, got a lot going on and uh, we're about to travel soon. And, and so you throw these like vague, lame excuses out, just hoping that the other person 
backs down, that they stop asking. But if they're just persistent and they keep asking, then, then finally maybe you have to just get totally bluntly honest and go, listen, I'm not going bowling. I'd rather get my teeth drilled. Like, I hate bowling. I don't want to be stuck there for an hour. Just give it up. So this is, I think, the, the dynamic now between Moses and God, that Moses is out of lame excuses, and God is still insistent. And so Moses just has to finally, honestly, bluntly say, I don't want to go. Please send someone else. And God is angry. And I can understand God's anger. He has said to Moses, I, I told you the plan. I said that I will go with you, that I am mighty. I, everything will work how I said it's going to work, and still you don't trust me. This is not a speech problem. This is an obedience problem. Do you remember another prophet named Jonah who refused to carry out his mission from God. He spent a couple of dark, fearful nights inside of a great fish, uh, contemplating why it would be smart to obey God. Well, God doesn't do anything that dramatic with Moses here. In fact, he, he gives in and he says that Aaron, your brother, is conveniently on the way and he can speak in your place. In church lingo, Aaron is about to be voluntold, right? Uh, it's interesting. God doesn't just set Moses aside and say, okay, fine, I'll just deal directly with Aaron. Mo Moses is still going to be involved. Uh, he's going to be uh, passing on the messages. I guess Aaron's going to hear them too, but uh, there's a sense that Moses is the go-between. You shall be as God to him. He says, and you will put the words in his mouth. You know, if nothing else, after this whole um, conversation with God, I just, aren't you glad that the Bible gives us the real, true pictures of the people that God used? That they weren't these perfect saints. That they didn't all have great confidence. That they hemmed and hawed when they were called. That they lied and they cheated and they did stupid stuff, and they committed grievous sins. Praise God that not only was that recorded, but that he used them anyways, because then I know that he can use me, and he can use you. Since God put up with all of Moses' excuses and issues, he can put up with mine, even as I grow in my obedience and willingness to trust him. Now, apparently, having Aaron go with him is enough to get Moses to stop bringing up objections and get going on this mission. So verse 17 is the end of the burning bush dialogue, the conversation, and we're going to see Moses pack up and go after this. So we'll move on to verses 18 through 26. Uh, second point, God spares Moses' life, verses 18 through 26. Moses went back to Jethro, his father-in-law, and said to him, Please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they're still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, Go in peace. And the Lord said to Moses and Midian, Go back to Egypt, for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. And the Lord said to Moses, when you go back to Egypt, see that you do before Pharaoh all the miracles that I've put in your power. But I will harden his heart so that he will not let the people go. Then you shall say to Pharaoh, thus says the Lord, Israel is my firstborn son. And I say to you, let my son go that he may serve me. If you refuse to let him go, behold, I will kill your firstborn son. At a lodging place on the way, the Lord met him and sought to put him to death. Then Zipporah took a flint and cut off her son's foreskin and touched Moses' feet with it. 
and said, Surely you are a bridegroom of blood to me. So he let him alone. It was then that she said, A bridegroom of blood because of the circumcision. Now Moses went back to ask his father-in-law's permission to leave, to head to Egypt. I don't know if this was a son, polite son-in-law thing to do or if this was like a two-week notice thing because Moses has been um, an employee to him in a sense. Notice that he doesn't say anything about his encounter with God. I think most of us would have just burst in, you'll never believe what I saw on the mountain and who spoke to me and what we talked about. But Moses doesn't do that. He just says, I want to go check and see if my brothers in Egypt are still alive. And not, I'm on a mission from God. Uh, maybe he thought that that would be too much for Jethro, that it wouldn't be well received. Either Jethro would wonder about Moses' sanity or the safety of his daughter and his grandkids. But Jethro lets him go. And we'll see Jethro again in Exodus 18 when he visits Moses to give him some advice. But Moses heads back, packs up his family, gets the staff that God keeps mentioning, and gets on the back of a donkey and heads to Egypt. In verses 21 through 26, as bizarre as they are, what do we do with those? They, they all have to do with firstborn sons, uh, three of them to be exact. So the first one, Israel is God's firstborn son. Uh, so Pharaoh needs to be told that the people he's enslaving are God's firstborn. Number two, if Pharaoh refuses to let the Israelites go, then God will kill his firstborn son. This is the first place that that's mentioned as a possibility. And then number three, finally, Moses' firstborn son, we assume it's his firstborn, Gershom, uh, and is circumcised, which, uh, or at the time, he's uncircumcised, which is a violation of God's covenant with Abraham. Back in Genesis 17, 10, God had told Abraham, this is my covenant, which you shall keep, between me and you and your offspring after you, every male among you shall be circumcised. God still expected this to happen. And God almost took Moses' life for this violation in verse 24. I mean, how can God have the leader of his people be someone who doesn't even obey him and bring his own children into God's covenant? It seems that Zipporah, Moses' wife, sensed what was wrong. And as all intuitive, proactive wives do, she stepped in and got the job done. Maybe there was dialogue that didn't get recorded here. Um, but she realized that God was angry with Moses, that his son had not been circumcised. So she grabs a knife and circumcised him. Guess Gershom didn't have much to say about it. Keep in mind that Zipporah's father, Jethro, was a priest. And so she probably knew the, the what and the why and how to do that. And, um, but then she says, you are a bridegroom of blood to me. After she's thrown this foreskin down at Moses' feet. I, I don't know exactly what that says. It it, it means most likely that she is including herself with Moses in the covenant family that was bringing their son into the covenant. You know, acting on her own, God might not have accepted these actions, but joined to Moses, God will credit this action to Moses as well. You're my groom. You're my husband. We are joined together. This is our covenant family. So God relented. Spared Moses. Didn't take anyone's life. As we close out this chapter, we see the mission to Egypt start off on a good foot as God gives Moses favor with the people. 
So that's verses 27 through 31. God gives Moses favor with the people. The Lord said to Aaron, go into the wilderness to meet Moses. So he went and met him at the mountain of God and kissed him. And Moses told Aaron all the words of the Lord with which he had sent him to speak and all the signs that he had commanded him to do. Then Moses and Aaron went and gathered together all the elders of the people of Israel. Aaron spoke all the words that the Lord had spoken to Moses and did the signs in the sight of the people. And the people believed. And when they heard that the Lord had visited the people of Israel and that he had seen their affliction, they bowed their heads and worshiped. So Aaron was told by God to go and meet Moses. And it's most likely that they met on Mount Horeb, the mountain where God had spoken to Moses in the burning bush. And Moses explains everything to him, right? He tells him the game plan for how they're going to approach Pharaoh, what the signs are. Um, and then they go see the Israelite elders. And they rehearse all of what they're going to do before Pharaoh in front of the elders, in front of the people. So they show them the signs. Do you remember the three signs? That the staff would turn into a serpent. That a hand placed inside of Moses' cloak would become leprous and then the leprosy would be gone. And then turning water into blood. And so despite Moses' fear that the elders, that the people won't believe him, they all do. And more than that, this encounter and this news makes them worship God in gratefulness. Finally, their generations of slavery coming to an end. You know, this acceptance and gratefulness on the people is not always a given we will see that the people are fickle, that they turn on Moses, that they are angry. They don't always believe that God is working. But we're off to a good start with Moses and Aaron received well in their initial return to Egypt. In the next chapter, Moses and Aaron will head, Aaron will head to Pharaoh's court where things won't go quite as well. Now, do you remember, I want to circle back to this uh, idea of not speaking well. You remember anyone else in the Bible who admitted that they didn't have the greatest eloquence like Moses, but despite that, they were still bringing God's word to his people. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 3 through 5. I'll give you a second to turn to that. Uh, it was in the responsive reading that we did earlier. The Apostle Paul said, And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling. And my speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. At some point along the way, Paul had learned that his eloquence was not the most important thing when he preached, when he spoke. In fact, in 2 Corinthians eleven six, 6, he says, Even if I am unskilled in speaking, I am not so in knowledge. The message of the gospel and the power of God were much more important. You know, that's a hard thing for modern churches and pastors to hear. We tend to sort of automatically elevate pastors and speakers who are powerful, who are polished, right? That's, that's just human nature. But the speaker who brings the truth, the power of God and the gospel, is a better preacher and ambassador for the Lord than one who is a great public speaker, but who gives the listener something other than Jesus and God's word. I have visited churches and seen men online who were absolutely riveting, excellent public speakers, but their messages were not grounded in the biblical text. I left thinking, I, I, I don't really care what you think. 
I care what God thinks and what God's word said. I wish you'd open the scriptures to me and show me the cross. That's what Paul did, right? And that's what Moses needed to realize was more important than being confident in his speaking abilities was passing on God's word that he had been entrusted with. I'd rather have a stuttering, shy, uncreative person uh, give me the gospel, the love of God from the word of God than a polished, technically brilliant speaker tell me to rely on my own righteousness. That's not an excuse for pastors and speakers not to work on their craft, right? We'd rather have both good delivery and solid biblical content. But if I have to pick one, just give me Jesus. There's a, if this is kind of a new idea or you, you really appreciate this, uh, there's a new documentary on Netflix. Uh, I've only seen the first 40 minutes that were on YouTube, so you could watch that on YouTube. I don't have Netflix, but it's called American Gospel. Uh, it talks a lot about those ideas. So, where do we see Jesus in this text? Well, it may be a few places, uh, but I'm reminded of a moment of conflict near the end of Jesus' life. When he is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus cried out, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. It's Matthew 26, verse 39. And let this cup pass from me. In other words, the cup of suffering that I'm about to drink, all of the pain and agony on the cross, can I avoid it somehow? We have to understand the agony, both the physical, but even more so the spiritual agony of being separated from the Father, of what lay ahead for Jesus with the cross. He was in such torment that he sweat drops of blood. He was saying, a bit like Moses, in just gut-level honesty, please send someone else. Find another way. But God could not send anyone else. There was no Aaron who could step in and do what needed to be done. Jesus was the only fully God, fully man, individual who had come into the world to live a perfect life and die a sacrificial death so that he could be our substitute and accomplish our salvation on the cross. No one else could do that. So, unlike Moses, who insisted on his own terms, on his own will, Jesus, the greater Moses, followed up that earlier request with, not as I will, but as you will. And you know, before this, Jesus had prayed in John 17, uh, verses 1 and 2, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you, since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Jesus knew that he had been set on this path to fulfill God's mission for his life. His whole life was a life of obedience, and he would not stop even at the hardest moment. And God was willing to have his firstborn son, his only son, killed in order to free the rest of us to be his sons and daughters. John 3, 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And Romans 5, 10, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. Praise God that Jesus was obedient and died in our place. Amen. Let's pray. Lord God, you call us to great things. You called Moses to great things.
to a hard task, a hard ministry. And despite all of his objections and not feeling worthy, he eventually obeyed. And you equipped him. And you sent him. Help us to see your equipping power in our lives. That you go with us. That you ultimately claim all spiritual victories that happen. But even greater, may we be reminded of Jesus' obedience in the face of unspeakable pain, both physical and spiritual, of his stepping into the void for our sins, dying on the cross for us, that through that all, Jesus obeyed and accomplished salvation on our behalf. May we live out of a sense of gratefulness for that. We thank you for these words. Help them to grow us, apply them to our lives. In the great name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.